Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our third and final session, looking at parenting through a pandemic and looking at ways to help your children play be and become physically literate. In our first session, we looked at why movement was so important, and we looked at how we could build up shoulder strength and core stability, um, and how movement actually helps children learn everything, not just about being better movers, but how it impacts on their academic attainment. We then started looking at helping your children be physically literate. And by that, we mean giving them the confidence and the competence as, as you, a confidence as long as the, as, oh, oh, try that again, Leslie. The confidence alongside the physical competencies to actually go ahead and play different activities, try things out, knowing that they will have a basic level of skills to actually be able to do that. So last week we looked at um, stability and locomotion. So in other words, lots of balance activities and we looked at different ways of moving and how we would adapt those different ways of moving, thinking about where you do it at a high level, at a low level, backwards, forwards, how you do it. Do you do it lightly? Do you stomp? Um, and who or what you might do it with. Do you do it with a partner? Do you do it front and behind a partner? Do you do it um, with a ball? So we looked at ways we can adapt movement to help ch challenge children. And the, one of the reasons that we adapt the movement is so that when children are faced with having to perform that movement, they actually have the skills to do it. So for example, when we look at force, if we look at doing something heavily or with a lot of force compared to do something lightly, let's imagine that your child is playing tennis and they are going to make the decision about whether they just tip the ball very lightly over the net or whether they hit a really hard ground stroke to the other end of the court. And by actually having practiced when they were learning different movements, have doing it softly, doing it heavily, doing it smoothly, doing it jerkily, they've actually got a movement vocabulary that enables them to make those decisions. So today we're going to have a look at object control. And when we talk about object control, it's not just about a ball or a tennis racket or a cricket bat. It's also about being able to use a pencil properly, being able to use a knife and fork properly. So it's much wider than just the physical sense. But we're going to look at lots of fun games and activities to develop object control today. Hopefully, some of you might have had a chance to try out some of the stability um, exercises and locomotion exercises that were in last week's handout. Please, all the way through our session, if you've got any comments to make, any questions, if you want to tell us about some of the things you've tried with your children over the last week, um, that might be on our handouts, please feel free to share. So without any further ado, because we haven't got a lot of time in our last session, let's look at some object control. I'm going to start off with thinking about lots of different objects because we could get carried away and get lots of PE specific sports equipment, which costs a lot of money. But actually, a lot of the equipment that we need to help children become physically literate can be very bought very, very inexpensively at a supermarket. Some of it you can make at home. One of the things I'm gonna start with using is a balloon. Now a balloon is a lovely piece of equipment. First and foremost, it's cheap, it's very easily available. But the most important thing about a balloon is that it floats through the air very, very slowly. So it gives children a lot of time to think about where do I put my hands to be able to catch that balloon or to be able to strike that balloon to keep it up. So let's look at just a little activity, balloon keepy uppy, I would call this. Let's have a look. So we're literally, I'm going to move that back a little bit. Maybe not quite so far. So let's look at just keeping the balloon up. First of all, children might just keep it up with their hands. And going back to last week, 
when we talked about if you introduce the activities to the children saying, can you do this? Can you do that? It doesn't actually matter if they can't. It's about just having a try and exploring. So just can you keep it up with your right hand? Can you keep it up with the other hand? Can you pass it between one hand and the other? Then we can start getting a little bit more creative. And this is where you as parents can make it a lot of fun. So we might say, this time you've got to keep the ball, the balloon up, but you're not allowed to touch it with your hands. So now children have start, got to start being a bit creative about what they do. So they might keep it up with a knee or a foot, another foot, or they might drop it. It can't just done, but it doesn't matter because we're having fun. We might keep it up on our heads, on our chests, on a knee, on a foot. They can do lots of different activities. We could then change it slightly and say to them, okay, sit down with the balloon. So this time we ask them to sit down and again, keeping the balloon up. But this time we might say, use other parts of your body to keep the balloon up. Doing this, you might have noticed that what I've ended up doing is my feet have come up off the ground. Now, if my feet are up off the ground, my tummy muscles are having to do a lot of work to keep me stable. And it might be I have to go backwards to pick something up. So there's a lot of tummy work going on there, but children don't realize that. All they're doing is keeping up the balloon. So what we could also do is then develop an activity and you could do it with your child or you could have, you've got more children together, they could play a game of sitting opposite each other on the floor and keeping the balloon up. But then you could make it a rule that they keep their feet off the ground. So that would mean that when one's sitting and a balloon comes over, they might have to lean right back to get it and hit it back over again. So again, lots of stability work going on there with a balloon. Now it may be that your child doesn't like balloons. Some children don't. There are some um, pieces of equipment that we can use alongside a balloon. Now this is a little, um, obviously a football, but what you do with this is you blow a balloon up inside it. So again, it's still soft, it's light, it's easy to catch, but it means the child doesn't actually have to touch the balloon. I got these down a party, um, you know that when you get party bags and things for children's parties and you put little things in, this was in a supermarket, very, very cheap. You might have someone in your family who's good at sewing. Um, this one is the same sort of thing, but it's made with fabric. And you can see it's almost like orange segments. So if you have someone who can make the shape on the bottom and then pieces around the outside, you actually then have a cover that children can touch rather than touching the balloon if they don't want to do that. Also, if it pops, it stays inside. So something like that you can use alongside a balloon. Another really nice activity, again, for object control, really inexpensive, is bubbles. Children absolutely love playing with bubbles. Let's have a look at what we can do with them. Just want to move that back. So, let's say we get our bubbles out. If we can open them, this is very stiff. Okay. Let's blow the balloon, the bubbles, and just ask the children to pop the bubbles with their hand. First and foremost, very easy. We could then progress it and blow the bubbles up very high and ask the children to jump up and pop them with their hands. So jump and pop. So we're looking at that action, jump, and pop. So you might even stand on a chair and blow the, balloon, the bubbles up really high so the children can do it. In our first week, you might remember, I talked about being able to cross the midline and how important that is for children's physical development, but also for their ability to read and write. 
So what we might do now is you could, you could put a couple of a sticker on each hand, say a blue dot and a red dot, or even just a mark with a felt pen. And then say to a child, okay, you can only pop this with the red hand and then blow the balloons, bubbles, sorry, to the other side. So the child has to go across the body. We could then again change it and say, can you pop it with a shoulder? Can you pop it with an elbow? Can you pop it with a knee? Can you pop it with a nose? All of those different activities, you're just coming up with lots of different ideas for the children to have a go with. Balloons, bubbles, really good ways of doing that. Let's have a look at passing and throwing. Again, we can do this with lots of different um, pieces of equipment. I'm going to start with a medium sized ball. Um, I'll talk later on about different size balls and different weights of balls because sometimes children might say basketball. They'll see a big basketball and think, oh, I want to play basketball. But actually a basketball is really heavy and quite hard. So if you think about it, when you see children learning to catch, they will often put their hands out, but at the same time they're putting their hands out, they're turning their heads away and shutting their eyes. So if they miss that basketball and it comes and hits their face, we can't be surprised that they don't really want to do much throwing and catching later on. So we need to be thinking very carefully about the different kinds of objects we give them when they're learning to throw and catch. So something medium sized, quite light, and I'm going to use a variety of different things so you can have a look. So we might just start, can you throw it in the air with one hand? Can you throw it with two hands? Can you throw it with the other hand? Can you throw it as far as you can? Can you throw it forwards? Can you throw it backwards? Can you throw it sideways? Can you throw it the other side? Can you throw it high and catch it low? So again, we're looking at, remember last week? Looking at the force, hard, soft, directions, heights, levels. So again, with the object control, we're adapting it in exactly the same way as we did with the um, other activities. So we might say, can you throw it and catch it sitting down? Kneeling down, lying down, underarm. So we're going catch like this. Again, lots of different ways of doing it. We might then decide, oh sorry, I've got one other thing I wanted to show you. Alongside balloons, beach balls are a lovely one for young children. This one I particularly like. In the national curriculum in England, <clears throat> in key stage one, which is our children who are between four and seven, one of the things they study in geography is continents and oceans. So this is a nice beach ball and it has a globe on it. <clears throat> so we can say things like catch it and then say, where are your hands? And my hands have landed today on the Atlantic Ocean on one side and on Australia on the other side. So we can start just by playing a little game, we're starting to learn a little bit about geography. But again, beach ball floats slowly through the air, nice big target for children to grab, and it's nice and light. So let's look at rolling the ball. Now it might be we can set up a target. I'm going to use the box that I had that probe from. So I've got a target on the floor, Tip it down so you can see. I have a target. I get my ball. Can I roll my ball and hit the target? Yes, I can. Children can make their own targets. So it might be that you um, make some targets out of old bottles or the small one litre water bottles and you might put some sand or some water in the bottom. Um, just to uh, make them stable like a skittle. So children can roll them towards um, those skittles. They can change the um, 
shape of them, they can also make an obstacle. So it might be that they decide that they want to put a chair in front of the target. So they have to roll the ball between the chair legs before it actually hits the target. So again, it's just lots of exploration of different ways that you can do things. Let's have a look at what time have we got? So um, what about bouncing a ball? Again, with the children, it's about feeling the ball in their hands. So can you feel the texture of the ball? Is it smooth? Is it hard? Can we bounce it with one hand? Can we bounce it with the other hand? Can we bounce it and catch it? Bounce and catch. Bouncing and catching is probably easier for children first of all because to keep it bouncing, they need to have quite a lot of control. They also need to have a ball that bounces better than the one that I've got. So they can learn to get that control and the bouncing. First of all, they do it standing still. Any skill that we need to learn, we don't want to complicate it by adding movement into it. So learn how to do it standing still, and then we could start looking at being able to move. So we might say, again, can you bounce the ball when you're sitting down, when you're kneeling down? Can you bounce the ball back through your legs? Can you bounce it forwards through your legs? Can you bounce it while stepping side to side, while walking, while going backwards along a line? Can you bounce it into a hoop? All sorts of different things. But again, can you? All the time when we're playing these activities, can you do this? Can you do that? Okay, um, let's have a quick look maybe at a one with kicking. So, I used my cones last week, but as, as I said to you um, last week, we doesn't have to be fancy cones, can be paper plates. They're really good. So if I make myself a little line of cones, now then, if we're going to do this with kicking, we'd be doing it maybe outside or in a much bigger space than I'm using here. But what we would be saying to the children was, could you kick the ball to land in front of the first cone, the second cone, the third cone? We might even start adding points into the score. So if they can get it to land, if I was kicking, if I can get it to land here, I might get one point. To land here, two points, three points, you can see. But you can make that um, as challenging as you want it to be. If you go out into one of your lovely parks, you have the beautiful weather there. Um, being able to do some of these activities with the children just brings it to life. They're having fun, they're kicking around. Another game that I quite like is called Fancy Feet. Now, Fancy Feet is about dribbling the ball. So if I just show you, I'm going to move my mat. So with fancy feet, first of all, we wouldn't have any cones initially. And with fancy feet, all we're saying to the children is, can you move the ball around the space with your feet? Some children might have a preferred foot, so they might just dribble with one foot. So then you might say to them, can you dribble with both feet? Can you dribble with the outside of your foot? With the inside of your foot? So all of those things, can you? And then it might be, we could introduce some obstacles. These might be our cones. I'm going to make a couple of gates. They could just as easily be your water bottles. So can you dribble through the cones? So they're going in and out of the cones. Then we might say to the children, can you, when this time when you get to a gate, can you stop the ball, turn and move off in a different direction? Now dribbling with your feet is actually a very, very complex skill. So some children might start off with the same activity, but dribbling it through the cones with their hands. Nothing wrong with that. All we're doing is changing the task. 
Also, when children are first learning to dribble with their feet and you ask them to stop the ball, they're most likely to do this. So they're dribbling around. Sorry, adjust that. Dribbling around the space and you might say stop. And rather than doing that, which is quite a complex skill, some children will do that. They'll stop the ball with their hand and go off again. That's absolutely fine. They're just learning. So again, fancy feet moving in and out. If you have um, more children around to play with, what they can do is you can have them working with a partner. So one person dribbles, the other person follows behind. Then when they get to a gate, the person goes through the gate, leader goes through the gate, stops the ball, passes it back to the other person who then gets it and they become the leader. So that one's quite a nice activity called fancy feet. Okay, so let's have a look at striking something. So if we talk about striking, it's about hitting something, keeping it up, a little bit like I did with the balloon. And when we start thinking about um, holding on to an object, so object control, out of the three fundamental skills, object control is the most complex because it involves something that isn't just part of their body. So not only are they learning to control their own bodies, they're learning to control an object as well. Sometimes we end up having to use an object to control another object, which becomes significantly more difficult. Um, around here, some varied. If I go back to my balloon, this time we could have a balloon and we could have the inside of a kitchen roll. I have a strip from some coffee capsules, same thing. So children learn how to do it with their hand. And then we might give them something to keep the balloon up with. So we're actually making it more difficult because they're controlling one object to actually hit another object up. So we could do that easily with the balloon. If we then start looking at a striking game, something like tennis, then we need to start looking at the complexity of tennis and how we build up to a game like tennis. If I give you an example, I have a grandson, I think I've spoken to him about him before, who lives in Dubai. And usually I go and meet him or visit him quite frequently. Last time I went, someone had given him a tennis racket. So he was really excited about uh, learning to play tennis. The problem is there are a lot of skills that need to be done and learned before you start with a tennis racket. So if you think about when we talked about from the midline moving outwards, if we then say um, we have a tennis racket, which is extending the distance, so that tennis racket then becomes something that goes all the way out away from my body. It's a long, long way from the midline. So it's much harder to control. So if we're thinking about learning to play tennis with a child, what we do first of all is just throw a ball backwards and forwards for them to catch. So we might throw it to one side, they have to run and catch it there, they have to run and catch it there, they might have to move backwards and forwards. But what they're learning about is timing of getting their body in the right place at the right time to be able to catch that ball. Once they've become quite accomplished at that, then we might move into striking the ball. But by striking the ball, initially striking it with their hand. So their hand almost becomes a little racket. So they're going to hit the ball with their hand. So again, same activities, moving the ball to different sides, but they're hitting it with the hand and they might be hitting it back to someone who's catching and throwing it in a good place to help them hit it. From then on, we might move on to a very expensive piece of equipment, a paper plate. 
And this time, all I'm going to do is hold on to the paper plate. So if I hold on to it like that, the paper plate now becomes my tennis racket. But if you think about the distance from the midline, the fact that my hand is behind this makes it much easier than having a tennis racket going far away. So they're learning how to hit a ball with the plate, which is not that much further away than my hand. Once we've done that and done lots of practicing with that, we might then move on to a tennis racket, but the best kind of tennis rackets have short handles and large faces, so they're very easy to hit with. My experience with my grandson, who had not done all of those things beforehand, was that after a few minutes of him trying to hit it and getting frustrated, the tennis racket was discarded and he was really cheesed off. And he was even more unhappy when his nonna, as he calls me, was trying to teach him how to throw and catch first because he was saying that had nothing to do with tennis. So if we're going to help our children become physically literate, what we need to think about is if, they, if we want them to play tennis or we want them to play rugby or we want them to play football or golf, what kind of skills do they need to know before they can play those activities? How can we help them learn and have those those skills first because then children are excited to try something and they've got some of the prerequisite skills. If we bring things in at too high a level and they haven't got those prerequisite skills, what they do is get unhappy and decide that they can't do it. And remember, we talked about a perceived lack of competence being one of the barriers to people absolute, actually taking part in physical activity because they think they can't do it. Now, some of that isn't because they can't do it. It's just they haven't been taught the steps to be able to do it first. It's all my, almost like giving a child a big book and saying, read that without having taught them to recognize letters and words and sentences first. So it's exactly the same way that they learn their physical literacy. Okay, any comments or questions just before I move on? Okay, one of the handouts that I've um, included with today's session is this one about how to include all young people. And this is when you're looking at activities, if you find that your child is struggling with them, how can you adapt them to make them easier? And how can you adapt them to make them more difficult if they're finding it too easy? So if we look at this, it's called the step framework. And what it looks like looks at is how can we adapt first and foremost the first one is space these aren't in any um, hierarchical order it just helps that it spells step so if we think about our fancy feet activity before i had the cone spread out on the floor so let's do that again so if in my fancy feet i had my gates the gates being actually quite small, but also quite close together, it means that it's very difficult for the children to maneuver a ball through this gate and get themselves ready for that gate. So if we wanted to apply step to that, what we would do is make the gates bigger so they're easier for children to take a ball through, and we might move them further apart to make it easier. Let's say we've got a child um, who started off with this ball. So they're dribbling through the space and they've got a fairly small ball, but they're struggling with it. So what we could do is give them a bigger ball. A bigger ball, as long as it's not too heavy, is generally easier to control. So we've changed the space with that. When it comes to things like making targets, we might move them closer. So we're adapting the space to make the task either easier or more difficult. We adapted the task when we started with fancy feet anyway. So I suggested that as a, 
a sort of progression towards being able to play the fancy feet game. Some children might do it with their hand. So we're changing the task. So what we're doing now is instead of it being a dribbling with your feet activity, it's a dribbling with your hand activity. So we change the task that we're actually asking children to do. Sometimes we might do that if we're doing some throwing and catching activities with children and they're finding it difficult. We might make it a rolling activity because if you think the skills for rolling, they're still having to be accurate to send it towards someone else and they're still practicing the skills of coordinating their timing to get themselves in the right place at the right time to receive that ball. They are exactly the same skills that they're learning and throwing and catching. It's just slightly easier. So we're changing the task. We then might change the equipment. So we've talked a little bit already about changing um, equipment to, um, instead of a heavy small ball to a larger ball, a lighter ball. There are some kinds of specialist equipment that children can use. Um, which might make it easier for them. This bit here is very easy for you to make at home. This is a bean bag. It could have lentils in it, could have rice in it. And all it is is a little packet stitched up on the inside. You can hear it. This is easy to catch. This couche ball is a, a sort of elastic ball. Another one easy to catch. A pom pom. The reason why these are good for children who are learning to catch, I'm just going to show you, you can see the difference. So, if I'm a child who's struggling to catch and someone throws the ball at me and I miss it, it rolls away. If somebody throws a pom-pom, it pretty much lands and stays still. The same with a couche, the same with a bean bag. These things land on the floor and stay on the floor. Often when you're learning to catch with a young child, they spend more time chasing a, a ball that's rolling away from them because they haven't caught it than they actually do practicing learning to catch. So something like a bean bag or a couche or a pom-pom that won't blow, uh, roll away are actually a good example of that. The last thing to change is people and that's with who do you, you do this. So it might be, as I said, you learn first of all on your own. So you practice your throwing and catching on your own. So all you have to worry about is yourself. Then it might be you do it in a pair. Um, in a, and once you get good at doing it in a pair, you might move into a bigger group. You might also look, for example, if you have some children who are struggling to catch, the last thing you want to do is make them a partner with somebody who can't throw very well. Because to learn to catch, we need to have someone who's going to consistently throw that ball right into that little nest that I've made with my hands. Not somebody who's going to throw it so far away, I can't catch it. So it's a thinking about how we can adapt using what's called the STEP framework to look at um, including all young people. And it's around making activities easier and more difficult. So hopefully after today's session you'll be able to have a look at that um, and see how you might adapt those. There are some object control um, activities in your um, packs as well so hopefully after that you'll be able to go, go away and have a go. So the other thing we said we were going to have a look at today is how you can put some movement into some academic activities and learning. So if we have a look at, I'm gonna have a look at some maths examples first of all, and then we'll have a look at some English examples which can easily be adapted to whatever language your, is your child's first language or something that they're learning at school anyway. So in maths, first of all, some, we often have children who learn to count in twos or fives or tens. And what sometimes helps them learn is actually putting a rhythm to it. So we might just have a little activity where we clap on knees. So we might go clap, clap, click, 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 click. So the children get used to that rhythm. Um, 
So if you're at home watching, you can join in with me. So it's just. And what we're going to do is we're going to get that rhythm, but with that rhythm, we're going to start counting first of all in two. So we're going to go two, four, six, eight, ten. So let's say, let's do counting tens. Ten, twenty, thirty. 40, 50. Get the idea? Sometimes ch when children are learning to count like that, it can make a big difference for them doing that. Another idea, a lot of this is around how you talk to your children and almost having a, a running commentary on when you're doing activities um, at home, um, talking to children about mathematical things when they're walking. So let's have a look at, let's say we're going on a maths walk. Now you can do this very easily from your home, wherever you live. So it might be things like saying to your child, how many stairs are there to get to our house? And counting stairs with the children. And then we might say, oh, we've counted up four steps. Let's count backwards on those four steps. So when we go up them, we count one, two, three, four. When we come down them, we count four, three, two, one. So children are learning to count forwards, learning to count backwards. Then we might say something like, can we count how many cars we can see um, when we go across the road to the supermarket? I know that when I visit my grandson in Dubai, he used to have great fun counting the school buses that we might see when we were coming home from his school. How many school buses might, might we see on the road? So just then talking to the children, getting the idea of counting. We then got to the stage where we saw so many school buses, we used to take a little pad with us and write little tally marks of count so we could then count and keep a score of how many different school buses we saw. Um, then we might say, let's count red cars today, or let's count white cars, or let's count taxis. So just looking for opportunities in the environment where you can start including maths. We might say, um, depending on the, the pavement, the pavement slabs, how many pavement slabs are there before we get to the supermarket? Can we jump over the lines in the pavement and count how many we go through? Um, saying things to the children, let's count up the stairs. So we've counted four stairs to go up. How many stairs will there be to go down? Because sometimes children don't recognize that if there are four and then you move them around into a different shape or move them in a different way, that there are still four. So getting them to understand what four means. Um, one nice activity, if you've got any board games at home, might be to throw a dice. And let's say the dice ends up on number three and saying, OK, can we find three of something in our house? So it might be um, there are three windows in that room or there are three ornaments on the shelves. So looking for groups of three um, that's being taken by the dice. It might be even thing, things like we could look at shape. So saying I spy a rectangle and seeing that shape on the pavement has four straight sides and two sides are longer than the others, that's a rectangle. Can you find any rectangles? So the child is looking for rectangles. So it might be um, they're looking for windows, they're looking for doors, lots of different ones. Then you might ask them if they can see any curved lines. So it might be that in some of the decorative gates on some of the villas, they might see some fancy scroll shapes. So they're looking for cur curved lines. And then it might be things like, can you see any triangles? So you're talking to them about different things that they might see when they're out and about. Um, lots of songs. A lot of the songs that we sing with children um, 
things like 10 green bottles hanging on the wall, five little speckled frogs is a one that my grandson particularly likes. So if we think about the way we can talk through this, so we might say, five little speckled frogs sat on a speckled log, eating the most delicious bugs, glug, glug. One fell into the pool where it was nice and cool. Now there are how many speckled frogs? Let's count together. Four more speckled frogs because one less than five is four. So all the way through, we take the opportunities to say one less than or one more than um, is this. So children get the ideas of how they can count the idea of one more, one less, fewer, more, um, all sorts of ideas like that. Things like setting the table at home is a really good one. So you might say, how many of us are there for dinner? And so the child has to say, there's four of us. Say, okay then, how many plates do we need? How many knives do we need? How many glasses do we need? What would happen if your friend came for dinner? How many more would we need? So basic things that we do in the house, asking them to help and join in, gets that idea of mathematical concepts. Baking with children is a fantastic one so that we can um, talk to them about, let's make a cake, how much do we need for this? Sometimes cup measurements are good for that. A cup of flour, a cup of sugar, those kind of ideas. Do we have more flour or do we have more sugar? So it's the questions that you ask them while you're doing the activities that make a difference. Things like doing the washing. Um, Children can have great fun with this. So let's say you have, you're sorting the washing into dark clothes and light clothes. So the children help you empty the washing basket and you can say to them, okay then, throw the light clothes into that pile. Throw the dark clothes into this pile. So the children are actually sorting the washing for you, but they're throwing it. So they're getting a little bit of physical activity. And then you might say to them, okay, if you get in that, pile you get two points if you get it near the pile you get one point so they can start keeping score um, of how many bits of dirty washing they get into the right piles they then might you might ask them to help you fold the washing and things like folding tea towels or towels are really good so if you get them to fold corner to corner then they can start seeing the idea of symmetry so it might be that you fold something and you say, oh, this is a rectangle, we're gonna fold it in half. It's still a rectangle. What if we fold it again? Is it still a rectangle? So you can look at lots of different ways of folding to get the idea of um, shapes. It might be then saying to give them comparisons. Um, who do you think's got the most washing when we've done it? As, uh, who's going to have the biggest pile? Are you going to have the biggest pile? Is daddy going to have the biggest pile? Getting idea of children being able to compare quantities and um, have a look at those things. We can also do activities where you might put some little sums. Now, some of these we've made. Um, these might be for some older children, but you've got some sums that children might be able to do. And the idea is that you might place these at one end of the room and the children have a little card that says true or false. So it might be that we have a true pile and a false pile. Whoops, both the wrong way. So the children have to take, a, um, take one of the sums, have a look at it and decide whether it's true or false. Obviously, you can make these at the level for your child so they can go backwards and forwards. Okay, you have got some activities like that in your um, handouts. Let's have a look at some English activities. Um, one thing that I particularly like in English ones is making stories active. Things like we're going on a bear hunt is fantastic, you know, we are going on a bear hunt, we are not scared. Well, things like we can't go over it, we can't go under it, we have to go through it. 
so the children can do all the actions with the stories. And it's even more fun if you join in with them. Then we can have short stories. There are some um, fables and such like, which you can then get the children to, to have to listen, which is a really important part of um, learning a language, a literacy, listen to different words. So the, the short story, The Boy Cried Wolf, if I give you an example, every time the child hears the word, to get up, every time the child hears the word help, they have to do a star jump. Every time they hear the word wolf, they have to jump up and make a scary face with claws. When they hear the word shepherd, they have to stand on one leg. When they hear the word villagers, they might make a small group if there's more of them. If not, they might use a cuddly toy, jump up, pick up a cuddly toy to make um, a vill villagers group. And then we might do the sheep, they have to get on the floor and make a shape with knees and hands on the ground as a sheep. So the children are sitting on this floor and you read the story. So first of all, it says, once there was a shepherd boy. So they hear shepherd, they have to jump up, stand on one leg. Who had to look after a flock of sheep? Down under the floor to make sheep. One day, he decided to play a trick on the villagers. Villagers, remember, they have to jump up, make a partner with a cuddly toy. He shouted, help, help, wolf, wolf. Get the idea? So children are actually acting out the story um, to do the, and learn to listen carefully. It might be that you ask them to hide a toy somewhere in the house. So they go and hide a toy, then they have to write instructions for someone else to go and find them. So they, they can watch where they're going, maybe give them some clues, but they're writing some instructions first. Might be that saying a sentence. Some children at the beginning, if I said the cat sat, some children actually just hear that all as one long word. They don't get the divisions between the words. So actually asking them to clap the words or jump the words. So you might say, the cat sat. But then you might um, ask them to um, add some words to that sentence. So you might say, what was the cat like? Let's say they say it was a fat cat. So we we'll say, the fat cat sat. Then you might say, where did the cat sit? On the mat. So we're going to go, the cat sat on the mat. So they start to see the number of different words and they might have to jump each word, which gives them more physical activity in there all the time. Um, Dance the word. So it might be that you put some music on and we're looking at a prefix, un. So let's play some music. We stop the music and we say to the children, move as if you were well. So they move in a certain way. Then you put the prefix on and say, what about if you were unwell? They have to move in a different way. You might repeat it with friendly, then unfriendly. Selfish, unselfish. So there are lots of ways that you can play with just making activities um, physical. Okay, I have a question in the chat. Yeah, okay. So do we have, I'm hoping, I've given you lots of different ideas um, to go away, have fun with your children, because that's what this is about. It's about having fun with your children, saying, can you, can you? But it's about talking to your children and just trying to make everyday ordinary activities exciting and interesting for the children. So does anyone, I've literally probably got one minute left for any questions or any comments. But other than that, thank you very much. I've enjoyed working with you and I hope you've got lots of ideas to take away and do with your children. No questions? Okay then, thank you very much everyone. Oh, that was, we have a comment. Thank you, Marion, that's good.
as long as everyone goes away and does something with those ideas, that will be the most positive thing for me. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.